Here's a look at the satellite across the U.S. during the mid-afternoon hours. Bear Clinic Low in Minnesota. Frontal System through the central U.S. Active Monsoon through the southwest deserts. And a series of stationary boundaries through the southeastern U.S. producing numerous showers and thunderstorms. Let's take a look at that surface map for this afternoon. Not really a whole lot to look at. There is a push of cold air coming south through the Dakotas into Nebraska and Iowa, but a rather stagnant pattern for much of the country. A broad Bermuda high extending into the eastern U.S., that's it there offshore. And when we talk about the Bermuda high, it's a huge feature covering many thousands of miles. So we're talking about this entire area of high pressure, not these little troughs. That spring and southerly flow from the Gulf up into the Great Lakes area. You can see the elevated dew points in that region. And then the southeastern, or I should say the southwestern deserts, dew points are still in the 60s in many parts of that region. Let's plot out the 60 degree isodrosotherm. Okay, so that's gonna come through the panhandles, come south towards, I guess about Silver City, then back up through the Mogollon Rim, into Page and southwestern Utah. Looks like there's been some drying in Nevada, 40s and 50s dew points. So the 60 degree isodrosotherm drops south and then across the Salton Sea, 70s at Phoenix and Blythe. So we are primed with quite a bit of moisture to work with today. And then going up further up into Washington, some very warm conditions to start out the day. That's going to be about 9 a.m. Pacific time, and there are 88 degrees there. Some rather hot conditions. Yeah, it's going to be a hot one up there. This is 11 a.m. Pacific time, 98 at Afreda, and 93 at Yakima. Let's take a look at what it was overnight. Back this up to about 12Z. I think that's going to be 5 a.m., Look at that, Afreda, 87. And those are pre-dawn temperatures. So Afreda never made it below 86. That's some pretty crazy heat. And then going north into Alaska, some very mild weather, 40s, lower 50s. That's going to be about 6 or 7 a.m. in Alaska. So that's starting out near the morning lows. However, that is rather cool, and you can see the cloudy conditions in that region. In the Canadian Arctic, a cobweb of isobars, a 987, 986 millibar low, up in northern Victoria Island, and some snow falling out around Isaacson, northern Banks Island, and northwestern Victoria Island. Don't really get a weather report up in that part of the, the continent, on most channels, but you do get it here, so enjoy. Also some cold air advection there in northern Quebec, but overall most of the Canadian region is rather quiet, some showers, a little cold core low over western Ontario, and that's about it. There's a look at the high temperatures for yesterday, lots of 80s and 90s. A few hundreds down there around San Antonio, Del Rio, and of course in the southwestern deserts. The San Joaquin Valley quite hot. 107 up there near Redding, 104 at Sacramento, and 103 at Bakersfield. Taking a look a little bit further up north, Canada looking pretty mild, 70s and 80s, and then we go all the way up towards the high Arctic, 30s and 40s show up, and check in Fairbanks, 60s. So, yeah, definitely some cooler weather up there. The warm temperatures found in Yukon with 70s from Dawson down towards Watson Lake. And let's check out the forecast. It is a warm one in the Boston area, 92 at Manchester, and it's uh, 91 at Boston right at this moment. 99 at Yakima, so yeah, we already know it's quite hot up in that part of the country. For tomorrow, more of the same, although it looks like the heat does crank up there in California. Those red plots, those are going to break the record for the date. 104 at Stockton, 112 at Reading.
Yeah, it's pretty crazy that that part of California gets worse heat than Texas. It's been a while since we've had anything like 112 in our part of the country. Anyway, 97, so heat continuing up there in Oregon for Sunday. The Monday map looking rather quiet. Seasonal normals continuing through Tuesday, although it looks like it does warm up on the other side of the Sierra Nevada. For midweek, that heat is locked in there in the Great Basin area. And for Thursday, problems popping up around Portland, so it will be hot in that part of the country. So now you have the full story of where the record heat is expected. And as far as precipitation, we can break that down on the Weather Prediction Center plots. A rare moderate risk for southern Arizona, southern New Mexico for today. Problems continuing through tomorrow. And then they migrate eastward into the Red River region of Texas. That's going to cover Dallas, Lubbock, Oklahoma City, and Shreveport. And we are going to be talking significant amounts of precip. The blue is going to be around one inch, the purple around two inches. And when you get into the browns, that's three, four, five, and up. So substantial amount of rain there in the deserts, El Paso to Safford, up to Albuquerque. And then for tomorrow, that moves out to the east, obviously getting caught up in some prevailing westerly flow. So Panhandles, West Texas for tomorrow, and then into the Dallas, Shreveport, and Red River region for Sunday. For Monday, looks like it holds in place there. Tuesday, so we're looking at a multi-day rain event there in Texas. And the National Drought Monitor does show that it is badly needed. So the area is getting precip or going to be this whole region right there. That'll definitely make a dent in those drought numbers. And there's how it stacks up. If you're in Texas and you like rain, well, you're going to get a lot of it. That's seven inches there through the week. Most of that's going to be Sunday through Wednesday. And a huge surrounding area of two to three inches. So let's take a look at the upper air patterns. This is going to be this evening. You can see that clockwise flow right there outlining the upper level high. So it has backed off down into Mexico. That puts most of the southern U.S. under westerly flow. That's part of that belt of wind known as the prevailing westerlies. And it is a split flow pattern. There's one band of jet stream energy right there and another one well up to the north. Now in between, you've got this area of troughiness and that correlates with a cool air mass in the Great Lakes region. And when we have a cool air mass up in that area, it tends to sink south, pushes out some boundaries out ahead of it, and that can be very efficient for producing precip. Let's go forward and kind of see how things evolve. You can see the upper level flow picking up a little bit, especially up in Oklahoma and Kansas, 60 knots. And not much change over the next week. You can see 50 knots there at DFW. And with that very moist air mass underneath, it's not going to take much to get that lift going. All you need is a conditionally unstable atmosphere, plenty of moisture. you got the cyclonic flow aloft, and those are some good ingredients for helping to support convection. And this is the other side of the picture, precipitable water. This is a very important chart in late summer. It not only gives you the amount of moisture that convection has to work with, but also if you have high amounts of precipitable water, there's a lot less evaporation going on and more of that precipitation can make it down to the surface. So what we have here, one to two inch precipitable water amounts, and then watch what happens as we go into Saturday and Sunday. Two inch precipitable water across Texas. Also a surface trough right there. Northwesterly flow aloft, possibly a little bit of differential advection, maybe a little bit of cool air coming in from the northwest and the mid or upper levels. That's a destabilization process. And of course, the low level convergence near that trough. 
So this is implying easterly flow up there near the Red River, southerly flow from the surface, and probably a little bit of overrunning in North Texas. And that pattern does not change much through Monday or Tuesday. And you can kind of see the cool air trying to work in from the north there, reinforcing that boundary. And eventually, things clear out in Texas towards the weekend. But look at that right there, 2.5 to 3-inch precipitable water in Florida. And, of course, there's a low right there, a little disturbance, tropical depression, tropical disturbance maybe, next weekend. So that'll bear watching. Looks like it's bringing that on shore somewhere in the Florida Panhandle, but that's 200 hours out. There's a lot of uncertainty what's going to happen over the next week, so that'll just be something to keep abreast of. And GFS brings a little hurricane out there east of the Bahamas, but again, that's way too far out. The takeaway here, things are going to start getting more active along the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast as well. And also from the northwest, looks like a new incursion of polar air probably coming in. But that could just be the GFS overdoing things. And let's check out the National Hurricane Center. They've really bumped this up here, 70% chance of cyclone formation in the next two days. However, that will affect mostly just the coast of Mexico. Not really expecting that to be in Texas, although the moisture that it's riding along with will definitely make it up there. A conspicuous absence of wave activity from the Cape Verde area to the Caribbean. Normally don't see that this time of year, but I'm sure that'll start picking up here in the next week. We'll see what happens. Checking out some areas of interest this afternoon. The thunderstorms are lighting up there in Arizona. This is going to be just west of Tucson and more of it from Safford up to Flagstaff, more of it in the Grand Canyon area to St. George, and also some activity starting up from wherever that telescope is. I forgot the, I don't really know the town names there, but all the way down towards Alamogordo and Roswell, some storms forming as well. And yeah, I've got to look at Texas as well. You can definitely make out the change in air masses. That right there, that demarcates the front drier, more stable air up to the north, and then the tropical air right down here, you can see the anvil spreading southward, indicating the prevailing northwesterly to northerly flow, shearing out those anvils and contributing to the bulk shear and helping with storm organization. And as well, yeah, that's a outflow boundary. That's from that early convection out around Houston, and just numerous storms all the way from San Angelo to Austin to Houston, back to Lufkin and over to Waco and back to San Angelo. And I know we have viewers elsewhere around the country. It's kind of hard to keep track of so many areas at once, but lots of thunderstorm activity with the other edge of that frontal boundary through the Carolinas. Lots of storms from south of Atlanta to Columbia, Savannah, and this is pretty neat. This is a potent upper-level low. This has got kind of hybrid barotropic, baroclinic characteristics. If we look at the surface chart, that's going to be right in here where that cloud mass is spinning. So that's pretty much over the cold air, close to the occluded low, close to the triple point, but it is stacking up and to the southwest into the cooler air. You can see the temperatures, uh, although this is rain cooled right here, as you go west, it gets into the lower 70s, and that's more representative of the air coming out of Canada. So yeah, that's a cold core low for sure, cold temperatures in the upper levels. And here's how we can make sense of that on these charts. This is the outflow pool right here. That's not really causing that upper level feature. That's being caused mostly by this mass of cool air coming south. Let's go up a little bit higher. 850 millibar temperatures showing the cool air right in here. And then at 700, that's up at 10,000 feet. You can see the cooler air mass right there. 
And if we drop a forecast sounding close to that low, that gives you the profile near that cold core low. It is conditionally unstable. So the slightest amount of heating, if you raise that from 63 up to, say, 75, your temperature plot's going to look like that. It's going to interact with that moisture. And your lifted parcel is going to look, yeah, about like that. So you're going to get some positive area and some showers and storms. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening across southwestern Minnesota and eastern South Dakota, and as well up near Fargo. And that's all for the Friday edition of Forecast Lab. I should mention I've put out numerous calls over the past month to help support the program, but it seems like it's falling on deaf ears as we've only had a single new supporter in the past 30 days. I need to re-emphasize if you want to see Forecast Lab continuing, your support is needed. Otherwise, I have to cut back on the videos and allocate more of my time to programming and writing. You can support the project by buying books or software at weathergraphics.com. A note in the order comments that you're a viewer is always appreciated. Or you can mention us on social media. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm not seeing enough of that. If you all are involved in forums, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, I do need to ask for your support. And I'll leave it at that. I hope you all have a good weekend. Stay cool. Stay dry, depending on where you are. And I'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.